Amanda Joy is an award-winning gardener and founder of the Peterson Garden Project, which is focused on educating the community on edible gardens. Modeled after the w W2 Victory Gardens, the project has blossomed from a single Peterson location to multiple sites throughout the city. Eating locally grown foods significantly reduces one's carbon footprint. It is hard to be more local than one of its own backyard. Growing your own food is both ecological and economical, and furthermore, it's a fun way to connect with your community. This relatively easy solution that anyone can implement is exactly the sort that pioneers search for. Let's welcome Lamanda Joy and discover how communities make a patch of city come to life. Junior High School in Los Angeles. Uh, something else significant happened that year. Uh, we, we, went, we went into war. So my parents, as young adults, lived through that whole experience of what we call the greatest generation. And so go ahead and hit the, the second one. As my handsome father, he was uh, drafted and served in occupied forces after just after the end of the wars in occupied forces in Japan. And uh, my mom and dad, as I said, they met in 1941. He was in the service in 1945. And in that time, they dated. They were together. They were love, you know, it was happiness, and uh, my dad's a little bit shy, my mom's not shy, so when my dad got drafted, go ahead and hit the next one, uh, my mom went ahead and planned their wedding and sent him an invitation to his own wedding, <laughs> he showed up, and I said, I guess I'm going to buy a suit, showed up for his own wedding, and they've been married 67 years. So go ahead and hit the next one. So I grew up with a family uh, that was talking about World War II a lot. You know, it was the biggest thing in their lives, and it has an impact to today. My dad, and uh, that's him on the, on the, I guess it would be your right, he was in the occupied forces as a paratrooper. He got $50 extra a week if you were a paratrooper, or extra a month, so he jumped out of plane, so he'd get the extra dollars. That's my Uncle Arnold. He was in the Pacific Theater. He was a, an island hopper, as they say. He um, got dengue fever, which was a viral thing that a lot of people got during World War II, so he wasn't able to ship out with his uh, troops, uh, and their ship got bombed. So it was a good thing. Everybody on the ship perished, and he survived because he was stuck in the infirmary on the island. We had one other uncle. I had one other uncle that was a bomber. He flew over the Normandy Beach operations, and there's family history or family mystery that there's some photos somewhere, photos that he took outside, you know, out of the bomber door that operation. Go ahead and go to the next one. The ladies in the family were also part of the action. You'll notice on the far side, that's my Aunt Alice. She wanted to be a wave, you know, so she was involved because they knew that after the war, people would be able to go to college. She wanted to go to college, so she was involved in the war effort. Um, my dad has uh, five siblings, so three, uh, four and five, five and six, four of, them left, four of them were all involved in the effort. Um, that's my lovely mother in the middle. She, when she turned 16, the first thing she did, she got on the trolley, yes, they went trolley back then, and went to the Weber Showcase office, which at the time, Weber Showcase made jewelry cases, but a couple years before she was there, when she turned 16, they converted to a munitions factory, so they made bomber doors. My mom got a job as a river. That's why I like, dress like this and honor my mother. So she was actually a river, she worked with the blocker, and they would make the bomber doors and write little love notes and put them in the doors for the, uh, the soldiers if they would find it. So uh, you can go ahead and pass the next one. After my, uh, you know, the war was over, my parents moved to Oregon, where I was born, just outside of Portland, and my dad learned how to garden. And you'll notice in the background here, this is my great grandfather's garden. During the war, it was a victory garden. After the war, it was just a garden again. My dad learned to garden there, and then when I came along in the late uh, 60s, uh, he taught me how to garden. I was growing up. So that's a little bit about that, that um, ethos. You know, I have this sort of unbroken chain of what happened during those times that I think is really valuable. So I'm very attached to the story and how it can make a difference for us today. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So who here likes to garden? I hope that there's a few people. Okay, good. 
Who likes to eat? Everybody. Okay, good. Well, if you're an eater, then you're a good gardener. You have the potential to be a gardener. Those of you that are gardeners, you know that once you get that bug, it's something that's kind of with you for a lifetime, right? So I got that bug very early growing up in Oregon, helping my dad garden. And um, I moved to Chicago in 94, uh, and I lived for a number of years in a condo, which was lovely. It was a vintage condo, overlooked the lake, it was very nice, but there was one problem. There's nowhere to garden. So every spring, it got a little obnoxious. You know, where are we going to garden? How are we going to garden? You know, we can find neighbors with backyards. There was no community gardens to go to. It was a little bit of a problem. So uh, February 2006, my husband woke up one morning. He said, should we go look for a house? He's like, really? Should we go look for a yard? <laughs> yes, let's go look for a yard. Go ahead and hit it. So we uh, bought a yard with a house attached to it, and we called it the Yarden. So that was what it looked like when we got a four-foot chain-link fence, lots of sun. We didn't have any old trees that were casting shade. We didn't have any apartments looking down on it. It was nice. So we bought this yard, and there happened to be a house attached to it. And the next year, go ahead, we put in this. So this is um, our Yarden. It's a uh, 1,700 square feet, all organic. We do all open pollinated. Uh, we have spotty fruit trees. You know, this was this was my happy place, right? So I think many people are like this, or maybe I'm just like this. But I think that everybody's like me. You know, like everybody maybe has had the same experience. So I assume that everybody knew how to garden and plant and do and all could have all these things that my parents had taught me, and I quickly learned that was the case. I started blogging about it, and I was like, whoa, people really don't know how to do this stuff, and they really want to do this stuff. So these are two of the factors that brought me to the story, but there's one more. Go ahead. Community. You know, I moved to this neighborhood. I've been probably lived in 10 different places since I moved here in 94. Moved to this neighborhood. We were going to stay put, so we really wanted to support the community. And I was at my, go ahead, at my local butcher shop waiting for, you know, my order. And I looked at the wall and I saw this photo. And I was like, what is that photo? So Reuben and Irv told me the story that uh, this photo, you'll notice here there's a sort of a rail. This photo was taken at the building where their butcher shop was in 1942, 1943 actually. The woman that took it lived in the neighborhood her entire life. And when she passed away, her family came to the butcher shop and said, hey, we found this photo. Do you want it? They collected all photos. They said, sure. They stuck it on the wall. I came in and saw it many years later and I was like, huh. So all these things sort of came together. I'm like, huh, I really want to understand the Victory Garden movement. And I had heard a lot of statistics, maybe you've heard them too, 200 million people garden, 40% of the food, or the produce consumed was homegrown. And I'm a little OCD, right? So go ahead and hit it. I said, said I'm gonna figure out how they did this. That's a lot of people learning to garden. That's a lot of people growing food. How do you teach an entire city to grow their own food? So that became my research question. I really dove into what Chicago did to grow their own food during World War II. So go ahead and hit it. Okay, these are going to be a little bit fast, so can I just do this to you? Absolutely. Okay, good. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the world at war. You know, the world war started in 1941. It ended in 1945. And in between, we had four summers where people were victory gardening. 42, 43, 44, 45. Most of my information is about 1942 and 1943, so I don't have the, the full spectrum, but that's okay. We'll talk about those two years. Go ahead. So war on the home front. During the last part of 1941, when the country was actively preparing for war, for national defense, there are already signs of food shortages and rising prices, and especially in the area category of fresh vegetables. Great industries were being transformed into munitions plants, and this quickly absorbed much of the country's pool of unemployed from the Depression. One of the first industries to fill the pinch of the labor shortage was that of fresh vegetable growers, as lower-paid field workers found higher-paying jobs in munitions and other war industries. So the, the farm workers were going to find better jobs, so there weren't people to grow the food. Another issue was transportation. Uh, transportation lines were quickly conscripted to move troops and munitions, which also the, the impacted the delivery of fresh vegetables from farms to urban areas. As one of the higher-ups in the Chicago Victory Garden movement uh, phrased it, Uncle Sam needs trains for munitions, so we'll have to grow our own carrots. So from the smallest family groupings, and I hope that the mother was taking this picture and not pulling the plow, but we don't know. People were desperate at these times. So from the smallest family groupings to the largest organizations, people used whatever they could to prepare their victory gardens. Here you see the mayor of the Boston Commons, of Mayor Boston plowing up the Boston Commons. Everyone was drafted into the victory garden effort. Religious orders, movie stars, I like to just pause on this, oops, go back this one. 
This is Veronica Lake. She was a very famous movie star at the time, and she was known for this beautiful hairstyle that she would wear. She was sort of like the peekaboo girl. She looked from behind her hair. Well, people were emulating this hairstyle so much it was a problem because they're all becoming Rose and the Riveters, and their hair was getting caught in machinery. So they talked to Veronica Lake about doing a campaign called Hair Wins the War. If you Google that, it's a really interesting video about hair wins the war, how you need to change your hairstyle. So for the duration of the war, she wore her hair like this to encourage women to wear their hair up. I usually wear my hair like this when I'm gardening and presenting, but I was just busy. Anyway, uh, movie stars were involved, cartoon characters, uh, superheroes. I'd like to point out poor Robin Schritzing up there in the speedo up in the, up in the corner. And of course, uh, popular culture. You know, you got really thirsty uh, doing your victory garden, so you might need to drink a Dr. Pepper. Or if you got a little more thirsty, maybe you needed to drink your victory garden beer. Or if you're really thirsty, maybe you just drink a whiskey and let someone else do the garden. But I'm just joking. I'm showing you these just to show how much this effort was part of popular culture. It wasn't something that was in the shadows. It was part of everything that people were doing. So back to the serious note. Industries, you know, steel mills, uh, Railway stations, Sears. Sears started 24,000 victory gardens in the Los Angeles area. Newspapers, and as I back to the popular culture, this is Marshall Fields. This is the window for Marshall Fields, and that sign says, "To make your victory garden grow, wear gay and chic gardening apparel." <laughs> Located on, in the sport department on floor six. So of course, industries, especially garden industries, jumped in full force. International Harvester, which is a Chicago-based manufacturer of plows, are still here. They're called Navistar. was known to be a big supporter of the Victory Garden movement. And I'm just going to take a little detour. You know, you got to eat year-round. You can only garden for part of it. Canning was huge during World War II. So hand-in-hand -hand with uh, food production came food preservation. Modern freezing techniques. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Modern freezing techniques were not widely used in tin and other materials for store-bought tea. Canned foods were being used for munitions, so women were encouraged to can, dehydrate brine, and otherwise preserve the harvest. Go ahead. And salute while you're doing it. Go ahead. So you can see that uh, uh, industrious preservation was serious business. It was a real war job. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to make some jam to give away as Christmas gifts. There would be no food if you did not can. So at one, uh, uh, one of the research uh, pieces that I ran across said that five billion pints, uh, you know, a pint is about this big. Five billion pints were preserved during World War II every summer. Has anybody done any canning this summer? Yeah? Yeah, it's a lot of hot work, right? Five billion pints nationwide. Uh, pressure cookers and canning supplies were in such high demand that their production and distribution were overseen by the government. Serious business. Go ahead. Oh, go back one. Thanks. So at the height of World War II, 24 million meals per day. 24 million meals per day were served on 50 plus battlefronts and fronts that the U.S. participated in. So you can see that the Victory Garden effort wasn't merely a morale boosting luxury, it was a dire necessity. And so here's some words for the times. Americans started gardening. Gardens began sprouting behind signposts at the bases of railroad road embankments, in schoolyards and churchyards, and in window boxes. They're attended by housewives who left babies in sandboxes while they knelt the scoop and sit the soil, and by little girls who wheeled their towels and rakes into their plots and doll buggies, and by war workers who were back to the good earth for the first time since they waded barefoot in uh, mud puddles as children. So the historic garden campaign of World War II began. So that's an overview of the nation, but let's talk specifically about Chicago. Go ahead. You know, I mentioned a little earlier that I'm OCD. You all know what that means. If you'll notice the acronym of this organization, OCD. They are OCD as well, so uh, they did keep things very organized. Let's talk about the Office of Civilian Defense. Go ahead. Fiorello Laguardia was appointed as the, uh, the person in charge of the Office of Civilian Defense. He was not happy about this. He had other things he wanted to do, and they did not include uh, working on the Office of Civilian Defense. But, go ahead. Um, the original uh, civilian defense organization was centered around preventative measures against air attacks, sabotage, and the like. You know, there was a fear that our enemies would actually make it to our shores. So people were preparing, you know, air raids and stuff like that. It was recognized that that same organization might well function in the Victory Garden field, and the OCD administrator in D.C. issued a memorandum in January of 42, urging local coordinators to set up machinery for promoting Victory Gardens. 
Now I have to tell you this from my extensive research. Not all cities use the Office of Civilian Defense as the mechanism for that. Chicago did heavily, heavily. Other cities did different things, but it seemed to work for us. So um, the Office of Civilian Defense activities were air raid surveillance, attack training, scrap and fat collection, war bond sales, morale committees, and victory hearings. So rumor has it that the Office of Civilian Defense was the brainchild of Eleanor Roosevelt. She understood the impact of the First World War on the nation, and she wanted people to feel involved, feel like they were active, not just sitting here passively while all the horribleness was going on overseas. So it was her idea. However, you know, the wife of the president at that time couldn't be, you know, the brainchild of something like that, or run something like that. So for a number of months, 18 months, she went to New York and she was Muriel LaGuardia's secretary. So he didn't want to do it, so she became his secretary and sort of ran things from the shadows. Go ahead. So Chicago. Here's uh, some words from the time. Victory Garden in World War II was radically different in character and extent from the corresponding activity in World War I. Lack of sustained promotion, absence of any organized scheme of promoting gardening, and general haphazard and wasteful methods destroyed much of the usefulness and productivity of the so-called war garden movement in World War I. World War II, at least, we learned from our mistakes, at least in Chicago, most of these faults were recognized before actual fighting took place. A thorough and complete scheme of organization was set up, largely due to the aid of the Chicago Park District, the local office of civilian defense, there was a continuous program of promotion, stimulation, guidance, and active help. Go ahead. So, um, this was our mayor at the time, Mayor Kelly, and he quickly appointed some park district bigwigs to run the program. You know, we were lucky at the time, the park district was probably the strongest, strongest it has ever been. Less than 10 years before 1941, in the mid-30s, we had three park districts. They were all run separately. They were all conglomerated into one park district. So they were very well organized. They had gone through this process of, you know, uh, making their, um, Communications, but we also were in the depression, so Chicago could afford really 